Alrighty, I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Lake Orion Downtown Development Authority Board of Directors, Tuesday, February 21st, 2023 meeting at 6.31 p.m. Susan, can we please have a roll call and termination quorum? Uh, Chairperson Burgess requested to be excused. Vice Chairperson Caruso. Here. Secretary Laurent. Here. Treasurer Shaw, Sh Shell. Here. Uh, Board Member Campbell. Here. Board Member Barnett requested to be excused. Board Member Cole. Here. Board Member Medina. Here. Board Member <coughs> Nash. Here. Uh, we have a quorum. Great. Okay, so approval of minutes. Uh, the first uh, approval will be the DD regular board meeting minutes on, from January 17th, 2023, page three in your packet. Motion to approve the Downtown Development Authority Board regular meeting minutes of Tuesday, January 17th, 2023, as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. So, second. Uh, Board meeting minutes would be the DDA special board meeting minutes February 7th, 2023 at 9 a.m. Motion to approve the Downtown Development Authority Board special meeting minutes of Tuesday, February 7th, 2023 at 9 a.m. as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The third minutes would be the DDA special board meeting February 7th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Motion to approve the Downtown Development Authority Board special meeting minutes of Tuesday, February 7th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All those opposed? None. So next we have two presentations. One with Mr. John Bryan with the, uh, John's first, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Michigan. Michigan County. Oak, Oak County, I'm sorry, Oak County, right? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Molly, I will. Thank you. No, no more runs for Findlay, Ohio, for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, John Bry, Program uh, Coordinator for Main Street, Oakland County. Uh, third attempt to do this presentation. Molly asked me to do this uh, presentation for you after I presented it to Leadership Oakland in the fall. And uh, finally got a chance to have an opening on my schedule to do that for you. So I'm going to run through... Uh, sort of a placemaking 101 conversation that we do because the placemaking term gets used a lot in uh, the Main Street world. And I've been doing this long enough for 30 years that it's a relatively new term that's come up in uh, Main Street. But it does tie into the, uh, the design component of the Main Street approach of the four points, uh, the historic preservation aspect, so it fits well. So Molly was actually part of one of the panel Right when we did that with Leadership Oakland, and she just asked me if I'd come uh, do this presentation for you guys, uh, too, for the board. So here we are. So I'm used to walking the room instead of standing behind a podium, but I will do the microphone, Molly. <laughs> it's like a cage. Yeah, there we go. There we go. I got upside down. There we go. So placemaking. So I asked this to the, the leadership group, and there was about, mm, what, 75 people, 80 people in that room from all over, including folks from Lake Orion. And this word, word gets used so much with placemaking. I'm going to turn this on to you guys and ask you, what do you think of the word when you hear placemaking? What comes to mind? Free thought. Throw it out. The destination. Destination? Yep. Place the, people want to come. Yep. Any others? What's that? A happening town. Kind of. <laughs> yep. Anything else? Well, you, you touched on them. So this is the definition. And this is the definition by Project for Public Spaces. And if you haven't heard of them, you probably should become familiar because they are the ones who actually coined the term placemaking. So they get the distinction of the definition that's on the screen. Placemaking is a participatory process for shaping public space that harnesses the ideas and assets of the people who use it. That is the official definition of placemaking by the folks who created the whole concept years ago. If you haven't heard of Project for Public Spaces, uh, they're based in New York. They've worked all around the country. They've worked around the world. Uh, they've done a lot of work in part of the revival with downtown Detroit. So they have been in our neighborhood. And uh, 
last week when we were doing the evaluation, the accreditation process in Rochester, uh, by the time that conversation ended the day, uh, Rochester is probably gonna engage Project for Public Spaces to come and do a deeper dive placemaking plan for downtown Rochester that ties together some different things that they have in their strategy and their plan, including creating a public space, sort of a, a common square, a town square focal point. So they have all these different ideas. So the thought was, why don't we bring in sort of these guys to help you kind of put that into all of a strategy, long term for placemaking. So they, they like that. So we're going to try to engage them for them. So placemaking, uh, the, you know, the subtitle I put with this is community soul, because that's what we're really talking about, is placemaking is what makes communities unique. It brings the soul. Uh, you guys have heard me say this before. We all have traveled to communities before in Michigan or beyond that you come back it's like, oh my gosh, I just love the way that community feels, the way it looks and, and such. Well, they didn't just fall out of the sky. Many of them have taken very deliberate steps to enhance what they have in terms of their assets and to build on that. You can't fake placemaking. You know, they try with some of the newer malls and things like that. Uh, there's fake downtowns. They're trying to rebuild what it already exists authentically in many of our districts across the county and beyond. So this is the formula that you think about for community-based participation at the core. And Project for Public Spaces, when it comes to placemaking, will talk about that that's always the place to start. And I've participated in some of the meetings and conversations you guys have had in Lake Orion in the past where you have engaged the community in terms of gauging direction of, of placemaking efforts. So the, the mathematical equation, and I hate math, I had to take college algebra and never once used the Pythagorean theorem to work with the downtown, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so local assets plus inspiration plus potential equals to that definition on your screen. Leads to the creation of quality public spaces that contribute to people's health, happiness, and well-being. I bet Everyone has been in a community, and I always make note of it, uh, in a lot of communities that I work in or visit with friends and family, that everyone a lot of times gets excited about a vacant lot, and their first thought is to do what with it? Farmer's market. Put a park, nope. <laughs> Put a park. Let's make a corner park. Let's do a park. But then I always notice you never see anyone using those parks. You can go through any time of year and they're vacant. No one's there. Nine times out of 10, they weren't developed using community-based participation. They weren't using sort of the equation beyond you. So no one has a feeling or a buy into it. And it's also disconnected in many times. It's really not connected to anything broader in where it's located. So they're unhappy little parks sometimes, I call them. There we go. So step one, create a common vision. This is what we talk about with placemaking. The vision can evolve quickly into an implementation strategy beginning with small scale, lighter, quicker, cheaper. So if you've been around Main Street and placemaking long enough, you probably have heard that last one quite a bit, lighter, quicker, cheaper, where people even test a concept of placemaking to see if it's gonna fly. One of the best known examples that we have in our region where they did lighter, quicker, cheaper was when they closed off Woodward Avenue where it connects downtown um, Detroit at the riverfront. You know, when you go down there now, you can't go all the way to the cross street. They now made it a, a pedestrian plaza with tables and chairs and landscaping and things like that. But before the city council in Detroit committed to doing that, they did sort of a lighter, quicker, cheaper. They did all the community input and the conversations and, and the vision and things like that. But before they spent the money to actually do that, they tested it with something that could be removed as easy as if it never happened. So that's sometimes what they're talking about when they're talking about lighter, quicker, cheaper. It gives you an opportunity to test down a concept. You think people are into it. You've gone through kind of process. But if it doesn't work out or it's not working for the goal you want, you can always easily remove it and then cost a fortune to, to do. Or you can you know, create an interesting placemaking possibilities, lighter, quicker, cheaper. You guys did that a few years ago with the alley, the Flint Street alley, uh, with the art with uh, the DIA. 
So that would be an example of lighter, quicker, cheaper, that you activated that space, made it more interesting, but you didn't have to have a lot of money to, to do it. So the community is the expert. That's another key component of, of placemaking is to create a sense of community ownership in the project that can be a great benefit to both project sponsor and the community. The two sometimes don't always communicate well to each other, uh, but the community is the expert. So the community is always going to tell you and kind of guide you on the direction where you want to go with placemaking efforts in your district uh, because ultimately they're the ones you're trying to get to use it, right? So that community piece is really important because they need to ultimately feel an ownership to it that they're going to be proud about it, they're going to use it, they're going to connect to it. Um, so community is always the expert and they'll let you know whether how they feel about it. Create a place, not a design. Uh, I think Scott would agree with this sometimes, that communities kind of get caught on the design versus the place. The design's probably the easy part. Uh, the place is a little bit more challenging to get it right. Uh, the goal is to create a place that has both a strong sense of community and a comfortable image, as well as setting for activities and uses that collectively add up to something more than the sum of its often single parts. This is easy to say, but difficult to accomplish. So those lonely little parks we were talking about sometimes, they were kind of created based on a design idea that someone may have had, but they're not working because they're not connecting or collectively adding up the sum. Anyone know where that photo is? Mm -hmm. I give you the clue in the, the slide. <laughs> it's Highland. It's the main intersection of Highland. It's the old Texaco station attached to the uh, historic house uh, behind it. That's pretty cool. <laughs> guest From the 1920s, yeah. I think uh, Roscoe, he was the chair of the DDA. He, he owned this property. So some key ingredients to placemaking, look for partners. We preach that in Main Street all the time, that the most successful downtowns, it doesn't matter if you're a 501c3, it doesn't matter if you're a DDA, it doesn't matter if you're a PSA or a CIA or any other acronym that we have for downtown management out there <laughs> across the county and the country. Partnerships are keys. And the most successful downtown efforts and placemaking efforts are the ones that look for partners and mobilize those partners to make their goals and strategies uh, come true. Observation is the other one. So observing it. Anyone know where this one is? It says Farmington. <laughs> Just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> so it's Farmington. But observation of how people are using the space even before you commit to a final design. See if people are using it. Get their feedback. Because again, you don't want to have a costly sort of, um, you know, effort in placemaking that doesn't work out what everyone would like it to be. So observing the space, you know, times a day that may be used, that's not used, how it could be used, how it can be connected to the broader community and district. Have a vision. And yes, this says Holly. <laughs> this is a big undertaking for Holly that we've been working with him on for a few years now. But having that vision, not only for your district, and you guys all have that, with your vision for downtown Lake Orion, but even thinking about the vision for that particular space. It's easy to kind of say, well, this is what we'd like to have happen there, but can you kind of describe that vision? And you know, the charrette that I sat in on a few months ago here, uh, you guys were having that conversation. You guys were having that, that vision. So what's gonna happen here is that lovely historic depot that's sitting on no uh, basement or anything, that's sitting between two active tracks in Holly, um, is going to be picked up and moved a little bit closer to their downtown core near uh, the head of Battle Alley. Uh, it's one of the last surviving train depots in Oakland County. I think it's one of six that still survive. And it's on the National Register and the State Preservation Office has signed off and uh, it's going to get picked up and moved and they're gonna convert it uh, as part of the whole Battle Alley strategy and their DDA offices and other functions. So it's a pretty cool project. So they have raised all the money to move it and uh, now comes the hard part of moving it because with the rail lines. Uh, start small. So placemaking projects don't have to be big as you guys saw with the Flint Street Alley. Um, to, to make a big impact. I like this picture too, also from Holly. I didn't have to tell you that one, but it's Holly. And for Battle Alley, uh, we actually gave them a grant for this through our facade and placemaking grant for those lights 
or the top of Esalen, uh, Esalen Lights or the top of Battle Alley. Oh my gosh, when, you, when they did that, which was not an expensive thing, you just would have thought that was the greatest thing that come in downtown Holly in years. People were taking pictures. You can say they're doing the movies. People do their bridal shots there. They put the car shows there. They put the fire trucks there. They just make this alley even more unique place that people want to do that uh, activity, but they're building on the existing asset that's already there and they're connecting it. So I don't think they necessarily were following all the rules of placemaking, but they, they fell into them whether they realized it or not. Triangulate, this goes back to the Lonely Park, converse, park conversation, is when you're developing placemaking opportunities downtown, think about how they connect to other opportunities nearby and, and make sure that they flow. Oops. They always say it can't be done. Oh, that is one of my favorite phrases because it just makes me dig in even more to show people that it can be done. My favorite quote is those who say it can't be done are usually interrupted by someone who's doing it or have done it. And there will always be people who say, we can't do that, we can't do that, we can't do that. Try me. There is always a way. There's always creative opportunities. There's always compromise. Uh, but sometimes it's human nature to take the easy way out. Uh, but it can always be done. And uh, sometimes by, by pushing that it can be done to achieve something unique, you end up with a far better outcome than anyone thought, but it, it can be done. Uh, I'm always, people, Molly will tell you, don't tell me it can't be done. Tell me how it can be done. Form supports function. A little bit of Frank Lloyd Wright in there. Um, so again, lonely park syndrome of what's the form? What's going to support the function? How does it tie together? Now that one I know you don't know. Maybe you do. Yes, it's Farmington. <laughs> and that, you know, they started this a few years ago with their Grand Raven Festival that they do on, because they're on Grand River. And so they started their Grand Raven Festival. And if you were at the main event last year, uh, they all came dressed in black boas and they were molting all over the theater. Like, what is with you guys in Farmington? What's with the black boas? Well, it's because of the Raven thing and they're really leaning into it. And this was really cool. This gigantic Raven sculpture that they have in that temporary, lighter, cheaper park that they have at the corner of Farmington Road and Grand River that they are just cleaning up and doing in phases and just kind of getting a feel for it. They bought that uh, sculpture and he's made out of recycled tires. And uh, they said it was pretty cool coming down the highway, bringing him home because they had to put him a certain way in the truck. So going down the interstate, his feet were just sticking up out of the top of the truck. <laughs> Money is not the issue. Uh, people always say, well, that costs too much. We can't do that. If the community has been part of the process and, and the formula has been followed on placemaking, the money will follow. If people truly believe in it and the community is behind of it, the money will come through one way or another. This is a great example. This is a, a mural that was done by Zach Curtis in downtown Pontiac. If you're coming on uh, 59 from the uh, west and you're going east, you can see her on the, the top of the Riker building. Um, and this was literally a placemaking uh, project that Zach, the artist, launched the crowdfunding campaign for and within a couple days had raised the $15,000. She is 60 feet tall. Wow. <laughs> so you can't miss her. And uh, a great story with her historical background. She owned land in, in Pontiac when it was first being established. And uh, they raised the money and the Main Street program in Pontiac ended up putting him over the top. They paid for about half of the mural uh, to be done. And the community outpouring on this when they did the dedication was incredible. They had over 100 people show up in the middle of the day on a 90 degree day to cut the <clears> ribbon. <throat> uh, you're never finished. It's evolving and managing. So one of the last things to keep in mind for placemaking is never quit. Always kind of be challenging your, yourselves to think about where you can go next, how it fits, connecting. Uh, but there's always a balance. So you don't want to get too over the top and you don't want to lose one of the key things that makes our downtowns uh, what they are and why people are attracted to them. And this is the same all across the nation. You want to always retain an element of authenticity. You know, you can start to kind of tip it too far in one direction that you kind of lose yourself. 
no one downtown in Oakland County is the same. Everyone looks a little bit different. And that's because of how they're built in their physical environment, how they're laid out, the scale of their buildings, their architecture, their flow, if they're on a river, if they're not on a river, whatever it is. So you're never really finished, you're always evolving, but then you're managing it. You guys know that too well as DDAs because many times you get involved in a streetscape type projects or public amenities in your downtown districts. And those are great, but you also have to manage those, right? They need repair, they start to age out after you know 20 some years, and then you're thinking about what do we do next? How do we replace that? How do we maintain it? So you're always kind of managing what you do. Four core, four cores, a project for public spaces. And these are too small, and don't worry, I'm not gonna go through them all. But just hit the four cores there. Sociability, uses and activities, access and linkages, and comfort and image. Those are sort of the four cores. You know how we have four cores of Main Street? Well, public spaces and placemaking um, also has four cores. And then radiating out of those um, are elements to keep in place. So it's sometimes not as straightforward as people may think. And here towards the end, placemaking is. This is the do's and don'ts, or the is and isn't, whatever you want to call it. Community placemaking is community-driven. It's visionary means sometimes be bold, uh, take risks, uh, function before form, uh, adaptable, uh, inclusive, focus on creating destinations. So whoever said destinations, yep. Uh, context specific, it can be dynamic, it can be transdisciplinary, and you can tell that scholars wrote this because people are like, what? <laughs> Trans transdisciplinary. <laughs> so it means it can have different disciplines, different opportunities. It's transformative. It's flexible, collaborative, and social. Those are the do of placemaking. The isn'ts is not top-down. Uh, it's not reactionary. A lot of communities do make that um, mistake when it comes to placemaking. They, sometimes it can be knee-jerk reaction. And I go back to the lonely parks. That sometimes, well, we don't know what to do with it, but I got an idea, let's just put that. And it's one person's idea, and it just kind of comes down from the top. So it's just kind of a reactionary set thing, so give it thought. Design driven, uh, blanket solution for quick fix, it's not a blanket solution, it's not exclusionary, it's not car centric, placemaking is not driven, no pun intended, well maybe a little, not driven by autos. Uh, one size fits all, meaning what one community may pursue as placemaking is not necessarily what another community uh, would necessarily work for them or repeating the same thing over and over to address something. It's not static, it's a living space. Uh, it's not discipline driven, it's not just one dimensional, it's not dependent on regulatory controls, it's not a cost benefit analysis, that's the money part, <coughs> and it's not just solely project focused. It's all those other things we talked about leading into that. So you just got the very bridged version of Placemaking 101 uh, compared to the time we had at the uh, Leadership Oakland. But I wanted to, uh, Molly asked if I would come give this talk to you guys because you guys are involved in a lot of placemaking efforts. And I would say the other thing that really wasn't mentioned too much was the authenticity piece. Because you can go to any downtown in Oakland County and beyond and kind of look for the things that make them authentic, make them unique. Um, and how that plays their story. And that's in part what people are looking for in communities. Uh, you can talk to about any realtor right now across Oakland County, and most of them will tell you um, that people wanna live close to a walkable downtown that's charming, that's got character, that things to do, but they, um, they wanna live to that, that character, and that's where the placemaking comes in. I have vowed that I'm gonna start doing a workshop about community character, because it comes in different layers, physically, culturally, things like that. Um, but this is sort of the, the snapshot, if you will, about placemaking. So you guys are engaged in a lot of placemaking uh, ideas and conversations that you've done in the past and thinking about in the future. So these are some things to think about as you continue down that road, no matter what those placemaking projects may be. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Any questions for me? <clears throat> I turned over to my twin brother, Scott, who we were comparing <laughs> beards. Uh, he was saying he loses his in the summer. I don't. I grew mine to look older. And if I lost mine, I would look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. So. <laughs> Keep my beard. Anything for me before I slip out? 
Nothing? No, oh, thank you, John. Thanks You're for um, everybody on page 29. You'll see that placemaking graphic that he um, had in his presentation. I liked it and I found it, and it's been in your director's report for a while. <clears throat> Do we need a motion to receive and file? No, for, for presentations, no. No, but the next presentation. Yeah, for Scott's, okay. Yeah. Uh-oh. Did you get upset because you took the thumb drive out? <laughs> no, I didn't. There it is. Yay! Take it out and plug it back in. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, as, uh, been present with you guys before. I'm Scott Reynolds with Augur Klein Aller Architects. I'm an associate with the, the firm. We actually started uh, many years ago here in downtown Lake Orion and have been involved for, for many years, including uh, working with you guys on the Lake Orion Lumberyard project. So. Um, before we dig into that project, I wanted to highlight some of the things that we've worked with you guys on, um, either partially involved, helping from the professional services perspective, or just volunteering our time. I'm a Lake Orion resident, and behind some of the, the many projects that John was speaking to in the past, including um, the alleyway project that I built in my driveway. So fun project, but um, as you guys know, you guys have been actively engaged in the community for, for many years, and I wanted to highlight a couple of the, the past projects that we've done, um, or, or you have done, should I say, um, such as the, the streetscape project that you know you see here in the, the lower left-hand corner, and then all the way to projects like the business incubator project that we did at what's now Fork and Pine. If you weren't on the board at that time, that was a project that uh, was actually a, a, a an existing building that the DDA was occupying. Um, I actually field measured it when I was a young aspiring architect to hopefully aspire to what it could become. And the vision obviously was that of something more than just a small office up front and, and warehouse area in the back. It was the idea that it could engage downtown and, and become a, a very pivotal point of our downtown. And um, I think you see that today with how activated <coughs> Fork and Pint patio is throughout the summer. I know as a local resident right up the street you know there's always music playing on Thursday nights so um, and and also to mention that that was a project that we envisioned and, and helped execute back in an early day in downtown when we only had um, one or two restaurants downtown so we had CJ sandbar we had um, you know what now would have been uh, 51 north and we had sagebrush so we didn't even have what would become Lockhart's what would become 313 pizza all of those elements so that was a project that the DDA played a pivotal investment point in to essentially create a catalyst in the downtown and really create the vibe that we have downtown currently. So, <clears throat> um, you know, speaking bigger picture of the Lumberyard project, we've been working at this for, for a handful of months now, and, and this was uh, the, the vision and the goals that you had within this project and why we were looking at this and, and what were our points that we wanted to make sure we walk away. Um, we always ask these questions of, you know, where, what, and how, you know, with a project, and, and how does it start? Is it starting with a budget? Is it starting with a, can we change the story? Is it a, because we need more space? What is the, the, the conversation piece? So a couple of, you know, points, you know, we wanted to honor the community, character of the community, and we wanted to preserve the community's heritage and, and its story. But you know, some of the initial motivation of this project of, of landing at the Lumberyard site was actually starting with the conversation of parking, and we'll get into that a little bit more here later in the conversation. But um, as we've evolved through it, we've also understood that parking isn't our only priority, but rather a balance of some of the, the community events that we have going on, the walkability of our, our community, and then also just enhancing those existing features that we've known to kind of come, come to love and, and what really makes us downtown Lake Orion. 
So, um, you know, this is something, you know, Molly and I have been, been speaking with and supporting her staff. Obviously, you know, funding is a, is a component that needs to be discussed, and, and there is the discussion of, of the Lake Orient DDA in, in which they would be seeking a bond for the Lumberyard project. So, um, you know, this is a conversation you've heard many times before, but obviously the, the DDA exists as a, as a tax capture redirecting those funds that would otherwise go to different places in the county that if the DDA didn't exist as you know would be redistributed <coughs> to entities that um, it wouldn't be redistributed back to the village of Lake Orion we would lose those funds right and I think that's a critical component of why a DDA exists is the opportunity to create those economic um, investments in your community because of that those extra funding and that's how we uh, chose to execute the streetscape in the past and how we uh, move forward with buildings like the fork and pint catalyst and even this building that you see here today although the village funded the improvement here moving out of the building that they're in in downtown Lake Orion which is now 313 pizza was part of that vision in that goal of, of the bigger picture of how we can better our downtown community. So, um, you know, just to touch base, obviously the, the original um, idea of this project would be uh, funded through bonds. That's a typical funding source that we see with public projects, especially when there's an income stream um, and something that we would, we've seen in similar places like the township for, for their municipal complex project. They have the funding sources established and they've chose to essentially spread that over a number of years and that's where the, the bonding comes into it. So um, as I mentioned before, this project really inherently started with the, the idea of bettering our parking downtown. Um, now both Warren, you know, the resident had in, in a volunteer hat and worked with uh, Jerry and his team when he was police chief on improving our parking downtown. And it was continuing to be a conversation that needed to be at least a forefront of, you know, if not today, then what about in a few years? What are we doing and what's our proactive plan to solve those issues? Um, and, and when we completed the recent parking study by Rich and Associates, obviously we land at numbers that were okay based on the current parking counts and, and loading that we have, but something critical to point out here is that it's factoring in sites that aren't necessarily publicly owned, and some of them are, are short-term lease agreements, and others are properties such as the, the pet center, right? We, we haven't seen a development being actually proposed or brought forth at, with a starting construction date, but that's a parking lot that has a number of spaces that are factored into um, this parking count, and when you start getting rid of those supplies, supply elements, we're going to have issues in forthcoming years. Um, and I think that the bigger discussion of that is not so much of, um, you know, can we provide more parking or is that our number one problem, but rather having a game plan in place. And that was where um, yourselves as the DDA board back in 2018 considered the idea of a parking deck taking advantage of the existing heights of a children's parking lot. It's approximately about 68 to 70 spaces and we're taking advantage of the elevation change and, and essentially creating a second story or a second level that would align with what would be Front Street. Um, or, or align with the, the grade of, of Main Street and, and gain another 72 parking spaces. Now, the issue or, or the concern with that was is the significant cost that would be involved in, in a parking deck project. A surface lot is going to be the cheapest parking solution going you know, to a parking deck, to a parking structure, all the way to underground parking in the sake of, of pricing. So this project in general was, in 2018, was estimated at a project cost of $4 million which led the DDA board and some of you are, are new members or members that were, were present at that time, um, that the question was, is, is this the best way to spend $4 million, which led us to the Lumberyard site. So as everyone's familiar, um, you know, we're talking about the corner of Atwater and M24 or, or Broadway. Um, it's, it's right there that the property wraps around um, Leo's Coney Island and uh, as you can see here in the image, it's essentially a, it's an odd shaped parcel, but it, it wraps Leo's Coney Island, and, and it actually, the shape of the parcel is generated from the existing railway, which is somewhat how we get kind of the curve to the northwest um, in downtown, away from our main street towards Oxford. So the existing conditions of the Lumberyard site, this, this parcel has been up for sale for a number of years, and you know, we've, we've come to know it as part of our community, but the, the business is um, 
less likely to kind of change hands or be a, a thriving lumberyard in the near future, hence why the, the property has been for sale. And we've seen um, proposals being brought forth for, to purchase and improve this property. But a little bit of a, a snapshot of, you know, this, this over 80 to 100 year old business, right, is there's a number of structures on the property that, you know, some are in okay shape, many others are, are significantly more blighted. There's a number of um, outdoor storage that's just kind of strewn around a number of the structures are collapsing. So these are some of the conditions in which we're, we're looking at with this parcel um, as just a baseline of, of why we're choosing to <coughs> potentially proceed in one direction over another. <coughs> Um, so as I mentioned, there has been other proposals for the lumberyard site. That's not something that we've just, you know, myself as an architect brought forth as a, as a proposal, but rather private developers looking at this property and saying, I want to purchase it and I want to develop it. So this is something that we saw prior to the DDA's interest in, in the lumberyard parcel is the, the potential acquisition of the property by a private developer to propose um, over 90 residential units that would be at least three stories in height, one to three bedrooms, um, parking, it's all essentially an internally driven um, development there. Yes, there was conversations about would they, you know, tweak some items if, if um, they could get additional units or more parking, but, but this is an example of, of what we're going to see, and you can see that um, you know, it's large three-story buildings. They're wrapping the Leo's Coney Island parking lot. You know, there is something that's up at M24, similar to what um, could be proposed if the DDA were to proceed with a project. But essentially, it's just an internally focused site. It has no public or community benefit other than that of the residents that would be there. And I think the other component to consider is, is you know, we, we don't know for sure if this would be for rent or for sale of components. Not that either one is a bad solution, but just saying as a, a lasting investment in our community and, and a contribution to what we'd see our future story. <clears throat> so um, obviously before we got too deep into the discussion of what we could potentially do at the Lumberyard site, yes it was the idea of we need more parking and I think it quickly became the idea that it could be much more than that and I think that's the exciting thing about proceeding with the Lumberyard project with the DDA and, and essentially guiding the, the future story of what that parcel would become. So um, as mentioned before, you know, in, in John's presentation, we hosted a community design threat. Many of you par partaked in that. Uh, we had the opportunity to go through many um, different exercises. It was held here in this room anywhere from kind of writing thoughts on a paper to sketching out on trace to putting stickers on, on different ideas and really just an open format of, of what could this parcel become and what are we lacking. And I think um, John Bryan didn't realize he was presenting this evening, but it, it was a good idea of, you know, what do we want our community story to be? What are we lacking? What else could we propose here? And I think that's the, the key to this um, proposal or, or this opportunity that the DDA has with the Lumberyard site is to, to potentially weave in these comments that got brought forth. So, um, you know, we had a, a lot of fun topics. You know, we, we went through one activity that was essentially talking about what, what were the great things that are downtown. Obviously, the DDA events that were coming, the access to parks and trails, the historic preservation that we have, the walkability downtown, what isn't working or needs some help. We, you know, the parking came up on a regular um, topic. The same goes for blocking of roads for events. And the fact that we don't really have in a dedicated event space, we're always kind of moving around different events downtown and we're shutting down streets, potentially um, creating havoc for downtown business owners or, or uh, patrons. Um, and that was one of the items that I think became a, a great standing point for, for what we can incorporate into future uh, developments here in the Lumberyard parcel. So um, before we got too um, far along in this project, we've obviously had the, the experience of doing mixed uh, use developments and, and we've worked with many downtowns. We're actually working with um, uh, downtown Rochester right now on some of their placemaking projects. We've had the benefit of essentially being a um, a community-based architect that, you know, we live, work, and breathe the communities that, that we have clients within. And um, I wanted to highlight one, which would be the, the, the city of Fenton, um, actually downtown Fenton. The upper image there is, is an image that you would essentially see from, from the 70s, and that was the downtown of, of what existed 
prior to what we would say urban renewal. So urban renewal took down most of those buildings. They essentially destroyed their urban fabric or their downtown fabric that they had um, and realized many, many years later that it was a mistake. Um, and the project uh, to, to kind of fix that was actually this lower image, the Fenton Cornerstone project, to reestablish their downtown. So similar to what we're talking about here in the village of Lake Orion with the DDA, the DDA in Fenton did a similar project. So they actually acquired a parcel. They took down a bank that had nothing to do with the community. I mean, should I say, let me rephrase that. It wasn't positively contributing in the sake of event space or, or retail or any of those components, right? It was just purely a piece of property that worked. And what they had was interest in, in their community was interest in CVS or a Walgreens buying that same property, taking down the bank and putting a Walgreens or CVS back from the road, nothing that would establish any sort of downtown character or, or any sort of vibe that they wanted to recreate. So what the DDA did is they acquired that parcel. They actually assisted in the early concept design, similar to what you guys have been doing to date, and um, established the idea of what this building would become, and then seeked a private-public partnership with a developer, and they, they did a public process to essentially say, you know, would you like to develop this building with us? And they had many uh, applicants and they had found the right choice and there was essentially a lease to own the property opportunity within this. They had to fulfill that they were going to build this building per the requirements that the, that the DDA and the city had set forth. And then essentially after a period, I, I believe it was seven years, that um, then that developer would become the sole owner of the property itself. So it essentially was the building plus five feet, the rest of the parking, all those other entities were essentially um, still a public resource. So there was that exchange there. So essentially this vision within the DDA and the city of Fenton led to this conclusion <coughs> that really sparked the downtown. Now for them, they had a number of two and three story buildings um, down there already. And, and this was a project that we completed with them back in 2014. And since then, they've seen millions of dollars of economic investment in their downtown, not only in their existing uh, structures that they have there, but also other properties that start kind of sprawling out in those outer rings of their downtown that have inspired what's going on. So this was a little um, way back when, when we weren't even Auger Klein Aller architects, but you can see in the lower left-hand corner, this was us working with them in 2011, so two or three years before the project was even constructed, but was talking about reconstructing um, essentially building A, which would be the image that I showed, this yellow building for, for the board looking at the screen in front of me. But what was the bank, you can see here the note, was this little corner parcel. It was set back, it didn't address their, their main street, and what they've seen now is that all of these other buildings, these the red and the orange buildings, although they said bigger picture could be something that occurs, have now actually occurred on their own because they've kind of started the catalyst, they made the initial investment, and now additional um, investment is, is occurring to have that ripple effect. They've seen um, many great projects, multi-million dollar investments in their downtown, um, including restaurateurs that left their community because there wasn't enough vibrancy for them to support where their vision of their, their uh, restaurant was to only come back to make that investment, own a piece of property, and, and be part of the future story of downtown Fenton. The other thing I want to mention is, is um, without getting too sidetracked, urban renewal was, was the idea of kind of almost taking a downtown and making it work like a retail center in a way. Um, so they closed off their downtown, but one of the pieces that was, was this, this is actually a retail center and part of it was that we actually decided that we were gonna clip off this building and reestablish better paths of transportation through their downtown. So it really wasn't just a building, it was all the other things that went along with it. So um, arriving to kind of where we are today with this concept, obviously we're talking big picture, we're talking about how do we fund it, you know, why are we doing this and, and how do we move forward is, is the idea of, of Everything that came out of the Shret, working with you in priorities meetings and then um, ourselves as professionals of not only um, helping create buildings downtown, we were, um, we renovated 27 Broadway for our office for 15 plus years. We rebuilt Sagebrush. But the idea that um, this lumberyard parcel could incorporate additional amenities that, that we don't have now. 
And I think one of the biggest things was this idea of a pavilion or a dedicated public space. So on the upper left, we see a farmer's market pavilion that could be a flexible uh, space. The idea that we could tie in a plaza area adjacent to that and also celebrate the existing fact that we're uh, um, a Michigan Bell Trail community along the Paint Creek Trail, which connects over to the Pollyann. You know, we had the opportunity to pull in public art while still maintaining kind of that vibe that we have downtown and that, that historic nature and character that we have that's uh, been established in our past. <clears throat> so arriving at this concept, um, where we're at right now is, is essentially a high level conceptual phase. So what we're taking a look at is, is essentially <clears throat> the balance of what could uh, occur here. And um, although you see a, a number of these elements, right, this is the idea of, of concepts and ideas that we would likely proceed with um, with a private-public partnership, right? We would want to see a restaurant tour come in to maybe grab one of these buildings and make it what they they need their space to be. Maybe it's this building by the pavilion structure, right? That that wants an outdoor patio. Maybe it's someone that that we already have downtown that needs more space and would be um, would be beneficial by having a new building, right? Versus something that's in our existing storefronts. Um, there is a number of parking here proposed on the site, and again, because we started this conversation with the idea of what could we do with parking, right? The idea here was is just to show our bigger picture of, of opportunity for parking with this parcel. This is not something that we're coming in and saying that we would recommend or um, require all of this parking to be built in phase one. It's the idea that we could park it, right? We wouldn't have to tear down a historic building downtown in order to create more parking similar to other communities that I've said there's no other way to go, right? There's the idea that, that some of this parking could be banked. It could be something in the future. The idea here is that um, you know, there would be a number of parking spaces here, but we have the opportunity to create an excess of parking so we could support business owners and their employees with still a walkable distance to downtown while freeing up the parking that we know is going to be kind of the number one priority to patrons and, and visitors to our downtown. Um, so with that said, um, one of the components here is, is we've gotten some, some great excitement through, through the, the project. Um, you know, obviously there's lots of questions and we're early on, that's, that's natural in the architectural process and essentially looking at a parcel that's this big. Um, but uh, along with some fellow uh, DDA board members, we've actually approached uh, Leo's Coney Island and, and asked, would you consider partnering with us to better this whole entire parcel in this corner? Because we not only just want to create, you know, the opportunity for, for additional retail space or residences, but we, as, as the charrette kind of brought out, right, we want to improve um, uh, access and, and uh, vehicular and pedestrian traffic through and, and you know one of those key opportunities here would be you know closing off um, the access to Leo's Coney Island making that one kind of common access point creating a vehicular entrance that aligns with um, the retail center on the south side of Atwater um, you, you know those bigger picture goals that we're coming together as a team to better this parcel versus you know not to go back in the presentation, right, but the, the private developer was strictly looking at uh, the black line, right? This is my parameters, and you're less likely to have someone like, uh, you know, a, a, a business owner like Leo's Coney Island say, sure, I'll, I'll give up my parking lot for you to put another 50 units in, right? I don't foresee that occurring. We're here, you know, it's, it's for the, the greater good of, of the downtown and to create more of a, a walkable and, and a public benefit here that I think, you know, is the exciting part and, and why we're able to maybe come together to better this intersection. Um, <clears throat> so to highlight a few things of, of that, that we're looking at is, um, we envision lots of um, opportunity for public art, right? We want this to be an engaging event space. And I think that's the, the most exciting component of this would be the, the proposed open air pavilion. Um, now that's something that could be a, a phased uh, project. It could start with a, a space. It could start with um, potentially hardscape, even landscaping, and then grow over time to essentially be a covered permanent space. Right now we know Dragon on the Lake and many of the entities downtown are, are forcefully using children's parking lot. We're restricted there. It creates safety conditions with the fire department and, and maintaining access when we have additional people downtown. And maybe by creating additional spaces 
spaces to not only um, create a network of, of event spaces through our downtown, but to potentially have a dedicated parcel for that might be a very good solution and something that really the charrette guided us towards was a space where it's farmer's market. It could be for Dragon on the Lake, it could be the beer tent, it could be uh, part of the flower fair, it could be a number of different things and, and the, the benefit of that would be is that there's a balance now or a second opportunity for a space versus our one and only kind of children's parking lot, right? Um, so uh, the lower left hand side you'll see a number of the, the items that are proposed or, or at least uh, uh, proposed in concept. So we wanted to maintain the, the, the public access way, um, the, the easement that was uh, put together about eight or nine years ago for the, the um, Paint Creek Trail. But we also wanted to still bring people forward and connect with, with downtown. So there is existing sidewalks on Atwater and Broadway Street. Sorry to the board that I'm pointing uh, behind you, but um, the blue line, right, is just kind of representing some of the vehicular or pedestrian access around the site, should I say, um, and the opportunity that this kind of campus style um, proposal would allow us to continue the fabric of downtown so, so this purple building, right, could, could be in a similar format and style and, and character to our main street, but we're also creating the opportunity to pull people from Main Street into the parcel and into the open air pavilion. It's visible by Broadway and going north on M24, but essentially we're connecting all of our different pathways through the site um, and, and not having it just vehicularly focused, but, but creating some other balance here. Same thing goes with, you know, Leo's Coney Island. You know, this is just a, a concept, an idea, but it is something that, that he's seen. Um, you know, is just recreating some, some more safety in his parking lot. He has the same safety concerns that we do with that intersection for his patrons. Um, you know, many other items came out of the design threat, such as the public art, the water features, butterfly gardens, um, you know, and the other opportunity that we're, we're looking to seek a uh, partnership with and, and have heard, um, I guess, the opportunity to uh, further discussion would be the parcel to the north that's essentially spanning between Meeks Park along the, the creek and, and our parcel is actually owned by MDOT and it's controlled by MDOT. Um, and the hope would be there is that we could um, work with them to, to open up a little bit more of that easement, maybe take down the fence. Maybe there's a, a more, um, I guess, subtle way to create boundaries and, and restrict access to those areas, but, but not just kind of this um, maybe cat cave that we have now back there, um, you know, and having that bigger, it, it, uh, the idea that this, this investment could, could contribute to a greater good versus just everything being, I'm gonna look at my own uh, parcel and own site. Um, <clears throat> So I know the, the conversation's been continuing and will be later on the agenda this evening for additional thoughts, but you know, I think one thing to um, discuss here this evening is you know, where, where this project goes from here. Um, you know, yes, we're talking about a large parcel in the community and is this a smart economic move for the DDA? And I would say yes. Um, we've seen with many communities, not only Fenton Cornerstone, who we worked with, but we've heard you know, Port Huron, the Holly, all of those are communities that we've uh, worked within or work with on a regular basis that, that would time and time again say, if you have the opportunity to guide your future story, you should. Um, and, and the key here would be is this is an idea in a culmination of where we are today. It doesn't mean that this is exactly the project. Right? We're envisioning something and we're having bigger picture goals that we want this parcel to become something that's community driven and a community benefit and a catalyst to the future of downtown versus a private developer coming in who we're not gonna have that conversation with except for um, the opportunity if, if they come in as a PUD or they come in with some restriction to re where we just only have that restriction with the, within zoning laws. So. Um, I encourage the conversation to, to continue with the Lumberyard site. Is it, it is exciting. Um, we're obviously looking to um, further this conversation as weeks go on, engage uh, council with, with additional conversations because they're obviously an integral part. And you know, I commend uh, the DDA in, in keeping their, their sights on the fact that the, the DDA is a, you know, an economic uh, investment um, arm of, of villages within the state. And I think they should be looked at that. And, and if we didn't have that opportunity, we would never be talking about this parcel, let alone um, 
Fork and Pint, let alone the, the streetscape project, the alleyway project, all of those other things that we kind of put our feather in our cap for and have very, a lot of pride for is because we've had those extra dollars to invest and because we've been strategic about them. You know, I, don't quote me on the numbers, right, Molly, but it's, you know, we were spending just over, you know, a million dollars on the streetscape project a number of years ago. At that time, we did finance that project, right? We financed that project, I believe, with the water funds, right, instead of bonds. But we said, we're gonna commit to this big parcel, we're gonna pay it off over time, and now we've seen that economic investment pay off to millions of dollars, right? I think we can easily say it's worth about $3 million in, in economic investment. So um, I'm obviously here for additional conversation and uh, plan to stick around for the, the agenda item too. So if anyone has any questions or, or comments on where we're at right now, feel free. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Nice job. Presentation. Appreciate it. It's exciting to see the uh, potentials. So now motion to receive and file. <coughs> no, we don't, we don't need to receive and file presentations. Oh. We, we don't have to go. I thought you said we had to do that one. No, no. Okay. okay. So next would be <coughs> call to the public. Um, so please, for, 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 for call to the public, please limit your comments to three minutes and also be advised, or, or, or address the, the, vice, the vice chair, which is myself, and be advised that we will not respond to your comments, although we will definitely take your comments uh, uh, and use those to just make our ideas. And, and thoughts come to fruition. So with that said, how do we go with public comment? We, I guess you, they come up by themselves and state your name. Mm -hmm. So come up, whoever wants to public comment, come up there, so please state your name and your address, is that works? Mm -hmm. And speak into the microphone. <laughs> okay, got time, cool. Yes, and please speak in the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> Corey Johnston, Village of Lake Orion. Um, three minutes is gonna be tough. I had an easy comment, and after those two presentations I have on a whole other meeting of comments, so I'm gonna to try to make this as quick as possible. Uh, my only comment that I was going to make was about the uh, charging stations that have been put in the parking lot. They've been up for about a month. I know there was a committee formed. I've seen people pull up and try to use them. They apparently don't work. There's a light on the side that says ready. They're apparently not. Um, I've seen people park there who don't have electric cars, so uh, the public might wanna know what's going on with that, or, or I talked to uh, Board Member Campbell about putting a bag over just so somebody knows that they're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Put something on social media, on the DVA website that says, this is what they are, this is what's gonna happen. That was the comment I was gonna make. Then there's two presentations. Um, Placemaking one is, is critical and it ties in perfectly with <coughs> the presentation on the lumberyard. Uh, Project for Public Spaces, which uh, he talked about, pps.org if you wanna look them up was started by a planner named Fred Kent. It's a nonprofit organization. And one of Fred Kent's quotes that I use all the time, and I'm probably misquoting it, but if you build for traffic and vehicles, you get traffic and vehicles. If you build for places and people, you get places and people. It's important for Lake Orion to have places and people. You already have the traffic. And you can't do much about it. You need to build a place and people. That's why I moved here. I moved here a year and a half ago. I moved here because I thought this was a place for people. Regrettably, I'm, think, I'm having second thoughts about that because of, no offense to the presentation, um, that presentation. I was at the charrette. I fortunately and graciously had, could spend an hour with your architect talking about it afterwards at Otsoda. Great place to talk, much better than here if you want to discuss something. Um, I have a degree in architecture. I have a degree in construction engineering. I've got over 40 years experience in design. I've done major shopping malls from coast to coast, Taubin Company. Um, I know how they work. I know why they work. I know a lot of them are failing. What you have here, what's been presented, although you can talk all the great things that could be done, is an Anywhere USA strip mall, Kmart, in the middle of a parking lot. You will not see that pavilion over Leo's landscaping and the buildings you're doing around it. You won't know it's there. To get there, you have to drive. You have parking. You are creating more driving and more parking. You are not creating a place for people. You will not see it. The two-story building that they're proposing with the lumberyard offices right now, <clears throat> first of all, you have to move a major power line that runs right over it. There's no two-story buildings along there. Otsoda is one story, Valentino's is one story, then you go to Children's Park, then you go to Wine Social, which is one story. Those are all one-story buildings, not two. 
unless that building has just a lot of character, and I don't know how you control that, that is not a gateway to downtown Lake Orion. This is something completely different than Lake Orion. This is Lapeer Road south of Lake Orion, M59 in uh, Clinton Township streets. I hope you don't want to repeat. Uh, it, they're just not places my mother lives over in Clinton Township. I know 59 all too well. It, it's just bad design. And as I say, I don't, there's nothing against AKA. They're a fine architectural firm. I have not worked with them. I've worked for many others. I know people who have. Nothing against them at all. But this plan, the, the concept, the talk is good. The concept as shown is really, really bad. In my opinion, if when I was in architecture school, if I'd submitted that design, I would have failed the class. You need something better if you want to sell it to the people. I have no vote on this. The people have no vote on this, so it really doesn't matter. But you really want the public involved. Thank, Thank you for your opinion. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Any more for comment? That's it. Oh, I'm sorry. Rosemary. Quite all right. Um, I'm Rosemary Ford, 225 North Broadway. And I'm in support of this because I think from the ideas of the charrette, you guys are trying to blend everything. And as he said, this isn't solid, but the charrette gave you those ideas to hopefully come together and make it a win-win for everybody. And as I said at the last council meeting, my thing is this is the last large parcel of land other than Jacobson's, and I believe it's larger in acreage than what Jacobson's is because the bulk of theirs is township. A smaller portion of it will be village. I think it's important that we keep this because what I'm worried about is, and you guys are looking at this, is that um, people are concerned with the development that's gonna be happening along 24. Um, but when this development first came out and someone came in and wanted retail and apartments, everybody exploded saying, we don't want any more of this. So they don't want it. You have to be careful what you wish for. So my comment to the village council and to you will be, this is an opportunity for us to do something and leave a legacy to our community. And I think with the right planning, we can come to uh, win for everybody, um, including parking, including the pavilion, um, a lot of green space. I'll be honest with you, some of you may already know, I am on the Parks and Rec Committee. And before you guys were even looking at it, because of Meeks Park, um, we were speaking one night and saying, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we had the means to get our hands on that lumber yard when it goes for sale? Because we knew it was coming up for sale. Unfortunately, we don't have the budget for it. And then lo and behold, an opportunity was uh, afforded to you. And so I think it's a good one that we should consider because in the long run, it's going to pay off. And... Uh, I know that they, Joni Mitchell's song comes up to everybody's minds, pave paradise and put up a parking lot, but it's not gonna be just a parking lot. I think they're gonna try, or you are, the community, even from what they said, it's gonna try to incorporate things so it can be best served for everyone. So just wanted to lend my support. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? <clears throat> Anybody else? Now we're done, right? Okay. So next would be the consent agenda. All items on the consent, consent agenda will be approved by one vote. We have the director report. <clears throat> there is the committee's minutes and work plan and events updates and financial reports. I think we need a motion to receive and file, right? Motion to receive and file. Support. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And then approval of the agenda it says here by order of the, of the vice chair, no matters will be discussed uh, after 10:30 p.m. unless the council, unless the board uh, votes to continue the meeting. So next will be financial matters. First will be bill approval, page 56 in your packet. There was a correction on the amount there that Mal Malik will talk about. 
All right. The um, the correct motion. I, I think we need to approve the agenda. Oh. Approve the agenda. First. Yes. Let's. I'm sorry. Can we have a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as written. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Thanks, Jerry. Now, financial matters. Bill approval, page 56 in the packet. <clears throat> All right. Um, please change the motion to approve disbursements in the amount of $66,836.49 for January 2023. And the amount, if you want to double check, is on 58. page 58. I'm sorry, what was the correct amount? The correct amount is $66,836.49. So, motion to approve disbursements in the amount of $66,836.49 for December 2022? January 2023. January 2023. Support. All those in favor? Roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, roll call money. That's right. Roll call, please, Susan. Remember. Campbell. Yes. Caruso. Yes. Medina. Yes. Loran. Yes. Narsh. Yes. Shell. Yes. Cole. Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Next item would be. DDA preliminary 2023-2024 budget on page 233 in your packet. I think, I missed. Uh, oh, I think it's property yeah, yes, acquisition. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Never mind. I was skipping over that. Uh, new and old business with both property acquisitions first. I'm sorry. Lake Orion Lumberyard project, page 60 in your packet. All right, um, we have a new um, proposed debt schedule and you can see it starting on page 62. Um, currently, at what we started out with was just a five million flat, um, but based on our plans, um, we decided to do four million, um, request a $4 million bond that is tax, tax exempt and then a 1 million bond that is taxable and that accounts for 20% of the property. Right now the buildings that we are looking at are taking up approximately 12% of the property. So this is giving us um, the ability to um, invest uh, and allow developers to invest with us on 20% of the property. Um, we did not have the opportunity to talk to the village council about the bond that has been delayed. Um, our due diligence date um, was set for February 19th. Um, we received our phase two and based on the phase two environmental report, we have um, requested a baseline environmental report um, and we've requested uh, that the due diligence period be extended um, so in order for us to get that report. Um, it has been extended for 90 days. They're still negotiating the details. Um, what else do I want to tell you? Um, starting, on, starting on page 60, 65, um, there is from our, from our lawyer, from legal counsel, there is information about um, legally what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. Um, and I mean, meaning that we are, we are allowed to do that, what we're trying to do. <laughs> and, and then talking about, um, starting on page 70, it talks about um, the village council's liability. And you know, there's right now, there's a lot of concern that um, this, if this project would land on uh, taxpayers' laps. And um, starting on page 70, it just goes over all of the ways that that is not going to happen. Um, the DDA law um, set by the state of Michigan definitely um, had in mind allowing for development that would be beneficial um, for a community, but it would not um, end up on the laps of taxpayers if something went wrong. And, and then we, um, as, a, 
at DDA here, we further added a protection by pledging um, TIF revenue to specifically to pay off the bond. And then we had to, with our bond team, we had to go through the process to prove that we could do that, which we have done. Um, we'll see in our budget, we've done that. And then, um, and then additionally, what we requested from the village council, and we haven't had a chance to really review that with them yet, but what we requested from them is that they also sign a similar resolution saying TIF revenue is going to be paying for this. So, in the event that something happened and somehow our DDA was dissolved, it still does not end up on the taxpayer because um, per DDA law, if you have something, if you've pledged your TIF funds to pay for a project, those TIF funds stay in place and those TIF funds are still collected until that bond has been paid off. So it doesn't matter what happens to the DDA, this project and these bonds will be paid by TIF funds. Um, the phase two environmental report um, is in your packet in case you need it. Um, I also have a copy here if you want to look at it. It's, there's, it's, not as, it's not as big as phase one was. Phase one was, you know, a cube. It was gigantic. Um, but it is here if you want to look at it. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to draw your attention to is on page 232, which is after the phase two, um, for those of you who have the whole packet, um, there is um, just a short um, description of what our bond payments look like. Where we are, um, our tax exempt, exempt bonds are approximately 3.75%. The taxable bonds are approximately 4.5%. Um, we're looking at um, an 18 year term um, and the total bond principal and interest over those 18 years would be approximately $6,894,938. Which is what happens when you borrow money People want you to, uh, they want to make money from you, the money that you are borrowing. So this is just what that is. It's just, we're paying for their money to get the money ahead of time. So are there any questions about the property? Oh, one more. The, um, the site design that we saw in the, on the, um, presentation tonight I took a snapshot of that and that is in the director's report and it's on page 28 if you want to take a closer look at that there now are there any questions so then the, the phase two study said what it said that we're, that we're considered a facility is that correct yeah it's um, yes there are some areas of concern on the property um, that have to be addressed. And that's why we need the baseline environmental assessment report um, so that we know exactly um, what has happened on that property. Um, we are, what we're planning to do to this property is unlikely to, other than addressing it and improving the situation, anything else we do is unlikely to make it worse. Um, and that's why we need that uh, report. Um, the report protects us, it says, at the time that the DDA bought the property, this is the condition that it was in. Um, so if anything related to those conditions pops up, we're not um, held responsible for, for that, for, for what happened, and we don't have to, um, but we are addressing it. I mean, obviously, we're interested in making this better for the community. Exactly. So, um, but that's what the, yeah, the phase two definitely said that there were some issues. Yeah, that's why I think Scott's, you know, Scott, or not Scott's, but the board's idea of this, of this property or the community's idea of this property, it's important to know that we want to try and protect the environment by using this to, you can't just have it open ground and, and open air space and, and start digging holes around this thing. So it's kind of cool. I think the proposal we have out there is going to cap off the areas that are unsafe in the future. I think it's a good idea. So I think that's why we have certain ways we can only go because of the way that the environmental issues are there, I think. So, but I think it's a, a good idea to know that we're doing our due diligence to save our community and, and also help make it a better place environmentally. 
Why, why is the entire amount not tax exempt? Um, because we want to have private public um, partnerships. We want to have developers come okay. and be part of the project. Um, that the area, we have to separate it. Right. There can't be a public be or a private benefit from the tax exempt portion. Okay. And somebody else using the land or the buildings would be deemed a private benefit. Jerry. And again, I think it's um, for everything that was presented and everything discussed when we look at what could be uh, another development with uh, parking concerns versus something where I kind of like the charm and the idea that the um, covered pavilion is not seen from N24. <laughs> I think that's an asset uh, that you got to walk to it uh, to see it and you have a little um, noise pollution control as well. Um, I, I do have a, a concern that I would want us to look at um, the taxable 20% portion. I love the public-private um, opportunity. However, um, I want to use the overlay of the phase two results to find out how that would move the puzzle pieces uh, to where that 20% would be available and what that marketability might be with considering the phase two. Um, and, and if we begin to look at that a little closer, then we might look at it as all of it as a non-taxable bond area, only in that that could affect it. If I could, Molly, um, we understand, you know, so we have experience with developing brownfield sites, right? It's going to become a, a frequent story in, in <laughs> communities because we're, we're developing green space or, or there's going to be... Um, facilities on parcels prior to us coming in and improving them, right? Um, I would just like to note that um, we're obviously still working through through the facility and documenting what exists there now, but there are many uh, facilities that, or, or sites that would be considered facilities that we've done enormous things with um, without much impact or, or worsening those situations. So um, the building that we built with Frank Rewald and Sons in downtown Rochester was looked at to be undevelopable. Um, and that parcel in general was um, actually a, a pretty significant, um, it was, it, there's cancer causing solvents from the industrial facility that was there existing. Um, and we essentially built a building over top of it, right? I worked there every day. You know, we essentially designed it with the, the critical idea that we weren't worsening it, and we're actually capping that so it wouldn't be any worse, and that's five feet from the Paint Creek Trail. So just to be um, clear, you know, yes, it might understand where maybe certain public amenities do or don't want to exist or of, of what um, impact or improvement need to be made for those, those items to be proposed in those, those situations. But bigger picture, you know, there, there's many brownfield sites in which we have the opportunity to still proceed with a concept without saying, hey, we can't touch this, right? So um, we're gaining that information to kind of work towards it. But I think the bigger goal of having the opportunity of this idea of a 80-20 split was because we wanted to seek partnerships and that could always move around the parcel based on what we landed for, for an overall cost. Thank you. Yeah, that does help me to um, appreciate and understand that there could be private development that wouldn't interrupt and would be marketable. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Oh, um, so the oh. one more time. Sorry. Uh, well, I don't know who would be able to answer this. So we got phase two of the environmental report. We know there's environmental issues there. If this property sits, I mean, the longer it sits and nothing is done about it, the more pollution, um, hazardous substances are going, you know, into our groundwater, into the community in some way. I don't, I guess um, that's my question. Yeah, I it, mean, if we do nothing, and, and now the phase two environmental report is known, so any potential buyer knows. Well, because we're a public entity and because we um, operate under the Open Meetings Act, yes, the um, 
our phase two environmental report is public. Um, right now, there does appear to be a natural barrier um, keeping the pollution from the groundwater, and that is good news yes. because we have a lot of water, <laughs> and water is important in Lake Orion. I mean, it's important to everybody, of <clears throat> course, but um, at the moment, everything's safe. We do need to cap it. Um, somebody needs to cap and um, and enclose the the areas that need to be addressed. I mean, <clears throat> someone's going to have to do it. I think it should be us, but if it isn't us, somebody still has to do it. Thank you. Do you have comments? One more. So when will we have more of an opportunity to talk about the design? We're, we're always all open ears on, on what, where we want to go from here from a from project standpoint. I know we're, this evening we're highlighting a, a lot of different categories. Right. Um, so, but, but feedback design and, and where we go from here is, is always an open conversation. It's definitely not set in stone. Um, the strategy at the moment is to hold where we are until we know what our funding is. You know, that, that's, we're kind of in a holding pattern. Um, Design-wise, I because it you know it, it, there's a cost every time, right. so so we we've um, definitely set aside a certain amount of money for due diligence, um, and the next step is finding out where our funding is coming from. Uh, I think this was. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I, the question I, I guess I have back to Lloyd's question is, when are we going to know when those puzzle pieces can be put together? Is there a timeline on that? Are you speaking about the addressing the environmental issues? Well, the and, environmental issues look like this. Right. And then we want to build looks like this. What fits where? Right. When we, we asked for a baseline environmental assessment report, Plus, we asked for a, um, it was kind of their recommendations for what we should do at, on the different parcels uh, that they were concerned about. So we are getting two reports um, with our BEA, and that's when we will have um, a tool that we can use to make decisions. Okay. Uh, so the next best alternative project that we've talked about was the, and this was talked about a little bit in the presentation earlier, was the parking deck at Children's Park, right? Yes. That was going to cost approximately $4 million? That was in 2018. I so, think it's going to cost $6 million. <laughs> Right. And how many spots did that create? 73, I believe. And how, much, how many spots does the proposed plan create? Uh, we could have an excess of 120 parking spots beyond what would be required for the potential buildings being proposed. So not saying right. that we'd have to do all of that, but right. there's, and the surface parking is at a significantly lower cost than a parking deck. Right. Per space. I have more to say about that. Um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons a surface parking lot is a good decision is because as our ve vehicular needs change, let's say for some reason in this community we s begin to love autonomous vehicles. So um, we have our little cars programmed to come take us downtown and then to go back and park in our driveways. <coughs> we don't need that big parking lot anymore, do we? So we can, if it's a park, if it's a surface lot, we can keep changing the way it looks. We can keep changing what it does. We can change its purpose. We can sell off part of it if we need to. We can do different things. <clears throat> if we make a deck, for the same amount of money, it's a deck, <laughs> and it will remain a deck. Um, and that's a, so that's a, and not to say that there's anything wrong with the deck that we were looking at, but I think um, for the money, it is um, smarter to have a flexible space that you can keep reforming to uh, meet the needs of your community. Any other, any other comment from the board? I guess we need a motion to receive and file. Motion to receive and file. Support. Um, we'll do that at the, at the end of at the end of our time, right? There's a public comment section, isn't there? How oh, works? public. Um, we have two public comments um, sections. Um, one is we just did, and then the other is at the yeah. end of the 
towards the end of the meeting. Yes. So we can comment on agenda items. At the, at the end of the meeting, you can the meeting, yes, comment one on agenda after, items. After, 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 yeah, after we vote on it. No, we're just we're voting to proceed and file. Right? This, that's the, that is the format for this. There's no vote No, there's no vote. Just proceed and file. All those in, all those in favor? Others? Aye. Aye. And all those opposed? Nay. We're all good? Okay. So next would be the DBA preliminary 2023-2024 budget. Page 233 in your packet. All right. I printed out the budget separately to make it a little bit easier to read. Um, the formatting was a little funny today. All right, so um, first I want to start out with, um, I again gave you the, um, we'll start with page 241. Um, this is the debt service for the property. Um, this, I'm sorry, this is the debt service for the road improvements. And you'll see that one, um, that is related to bigger one so I can see better. All right, on page 236, on page 236 at the top, um, you'll see um, 248-260 nine six five four oh four um this is for the road improvements and the slater parking lot um it's that debt service and if we do the bond service i am proposing that we pay off a good chunk of it this year um, to reduce um, the debt load that we have in the coming years so that's why you see um, in 22-23, a revised projection of showing um, 310000 being paid back to the village. Um, this is not necessary. It, this is only necessary if we're doing the bond. It's not necessary if we are not doing the bond. And then... On page 239... Um, 248-730-965-404. It says transfer out DDA property acquisition fund. Um, you'll see um, for the 23-24 the projection plus, plus the next two years after that, you'll see the, um, the bond payment. And that is corresponding to page 244 showing um, the debt service being paid. Um, once the bond has been approved, we'll have a separate, this will be changed to reflect five million going in and five million going out. Um, we're not there yet, so I'm just showing um, that we can pay for it. I'm just showing that it, it can be paid for. Are there any questions about the budget? Um, our budget is part of the village council, the village's larger budget, their whole encompassing budget. Um, so what you would do today is recommend that the budget, um, recommend the budget to village council for inclusion in their overall 23-24 budget. Motion to recommend the attached 2023-2024 DDA budget to village council for inclusion in their overall 2023-2024 budget. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Discussion afterwards? No. Any discussion? No. Okay. 
Cool. So next <clears throat> is approval. Let's see what's here. Approval of the dumpster enclosure uh, for RFQ. All right, this is try number two <laughs> for this bid. And this is for re um, construction of a dumpster enclosure um, in the northwest corner of the parking lot located at Front and Anderson. So kind of um, directly behind um, the Lake Orion window treatment store behind there. Um, we're proposing that we add a, um, a dumpster. There are There is a community <coughs> dumpster um, located behind 313 Pizza Bar as well. And the thought was let's do all the quadrants and get the garbage off of the sidewalks and into a dumpster behind um, and make our streets and um, more pleasant. So all I'm asking for today is um, an approval to, oh, I have more, I'm asking for more. I'm asking for approval of the public posting and also I'm asking for um, two more members in addition to Matt Shell um, to review the bids when they come in. And the bids, um, we will be opening bids at noon on um, Friday, March 24th. And then the review period, um, we'll have one or two, meet, one or two more meetings um, between March 27th and April 14th. A motion to approve. I need I need volunteers, and then volunteers. we can approve. <laughs> I'll volunteer for that. Okay. I can help, but I'll be in Florida March 27th through April 5th. But I'm happy to. Oh, help. but you'll be there from April 5th. I to can the 14th. be there on the 24th. And on then the 24th. I could be there on the 24th, but not mm -hmm. the 27th through April 5th. Because right. you said there were some additional. Right. Well, from the 5th to the 14th, you're still available, though? Yes. Or 6th. Okay. That works for me. Okay. All right. So um, it would, the motion that I'm recommending is to pr approve publication of the enclosure RFQ and to appoint Matt Shell, Sam Crusoe, and Elena, Elena Campbell to the review team. I'll make a motion um, to approve publication of the dumpster enclosure construction RFQ and appoint the following board members to the review team, Matt Schell, Sam Crusoe, and Elena Kim. Support. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Can we have comment from the public if there's not part of our agenda? I thought, it was, I thought the whole point was that we have Call the public at the end of our agenda. Your bid documents are incomplete. You are not going to get good bids. That's my comment. It's what I do for a living. Okay. Well, you were there. So next would be approval of in-ground crosswalk lighting RFQ. All right. Um, when the design committee completed the retrofit of the lampposts um, to the dark sky compliant lighting um, that made it 50% brighter, they still had money left over in the budget. And this is for pedestrian safety and lighting. This is another suggestion that we could um, get some quotes on. This is for um, lights that are on the ground um, lining um, either side of the crosswalk and they blink. So um, imagine you are at Broadway and Flint and you want to turn right. So you're, you're in your car and you're looking that way. You're looking to the left to see if there's any cars coming. And maybe there's someone actually in the crosswalk walking. Um, and, you know, maybe you might almost hit them. <laughs> but... Um, with these lights, if there's someone in the crosswalk, it's going to blink. So as you're looking this way you're in your periphery, you're going to see blinking. And that's, that's what we thought this would be a safety measure. So um, this is just a requesting um, that we get quotes on this. It's not, we don't, 
Um, there's approximately like thirty. $39,000 left that we could um, spend towards something, and this is a suggestion. You guys don't have to do this. You don't have to allow us to, to get quotes on this if you don't want to. We could save the money instead towards the parking project. Um, but right now, all we're doing is um, asking for um, to be able to get quotes on it. Is this, is this a sign on the side or strips that go across? The, the strips go right across, um, you know, the cars drive right over them. They're, they're little flat guys, and they just, they blink. That corner is, or that intersection is really bad. I know. You know I, I'm sure we've all tried to, you know, cross and almost, you know, had to put your hand out and say, stop, you know, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. There's a couple other, inter, or a couple other spots that are like that also, but. I think we wanted to mainly take care of this first, right? Well, we wanted, quote, to, right? Yeah, we wanted to see, uh, we wanted the quote to tell us what it would be for this, this four section um, crosswalk area. And um, because that would be our number one, but then if this is affordable, we could expand it to some other important areas. Did you raise your hand up? Yeah, and it is. That's the word. the last ticket I wrote as a police officer in Lake Orion was for somebody ignoring a pedestrian in that intersection, and uh, they were nearly hit. Um, that that's the busiest of our uh, crosswalks. That and the crosswalks uh, from crossing M24 at Flint Street. That's another danger zone for which there's traffic data. But this, of course, does meet the Michigan Uniform Traffic Code. Uh, for intersections and for, I'm assuming that the, the bid um, is ensuring that the, the signage or the lighting meets the Michigan uniform traffic. Well, we probably oh, can we're... add that. I don't think we asked for that. So we'll add that to, I'll get with you afterwards. And yeah, we'll and I think that would that be wise language. to put that in the spec that it meets the criteria for all signage and lights within the Michigan uniform traffic code. Okay. Have you had experience in the past with, with that kind of lighting system? No, I mean, you know, different towns have different things at their crosswalks. Uh, City of Rochester has the audible, um, right. 10 9, and then they have the tone. Yeah. Uh, that's more for the um, blind and others. But um, so there's, there's different ways of, you know, we now have, such as uh, on Atwater, we have the flashing pedestrian crossing, and again, the midpoint crossing that we have coming off of our boat docks to get folks downtown. Um, you know, the, more, the more flashing lights, missiles going up, explosions, um, to warn motorists that, uh, um, you know, there are people in town. You're never going to eradicate or mitigate hazards, but uh, I think this would uh, be helpful. It would, it would only be successful with a massive public relations um, education segment that could be out there in newspaper, uh, social media, and other things, website letting people know how that works. So if by the corner of your eye you see those flashing lights, that means there's somebody in the crosswalk. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great safety measure, personally. So do you need approval for this, or can you just keep going? Um, this will be the same thing. I need approval for the public posting, and then um, the review team, this is the same, same time schedule, so the review team can be the same as the last one. Um, so that would be Matt, Sam, and Elena, and that's and it's on page um, 257. If you want to look at it, the and the review team makes a recommendation to this board before anyone is picked or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Elena, do you have a comment? Oh, I just had a quick question about um, it goes in the ground. Don't we have brick there? Mm -hmm. So it'll work with the brick. I mean, um, I don't know. We're actually, I mean, we, we're actually thinking it might be easier at oh, the main they can intersection just pop because the, the wires that connect everything, it, the, the wires connect to a solar is what we're asking for. We're asking for solar. Because they won't have to cut pavement then. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, good point. Thank you. City recommendation. Mm -hmm. It's on page 257. So 
Motion to approve publication of the dumpster enclosure construction RFQ and to appoint. <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry, wrong page. Of the, of the no, it's at like the wrong page. Yeah. I didn't. Oh, you just it's a typo on that so, page. So yeah, it's okay. a typo. In ground crosswalk lighting RFQ. All right, motion to approve publication of the downtown lighting ground crosswalk, in ground crosswalk lighting RFQ, and to appoint Matt Shell, Sam Caruso, and Elena Campbell to the review team. Support. <coughs> Support. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries. Next would be the Lake Orion Live, LO Live Music Series contract, page 268 in your packet. All right. Um, so this is for our LO Live Music Series um, gazebo concerts in the park. Um, this is proposed for Wednesdays, weekly Wednesdays, starting July 5th and ending August 30th. There would be eight concerts. Um, we're asking, this is um, with 20 Front Street. Um, we actually have two different resolutions um, that we would approve today. Um, the first one says that we have chosen to work with 20 Front Street. Um, because they are um, one of our um, anchor businesses in downtown and they are experts in the entertainment services. Um, and we, we want to have um, a positive ongoing working relationship with them and, and we have for years. So that's, that's the first resolution <laughs> saying um, why we didn't go to bid for this, why we went, we have it exclusively with 20 Front Street. And then the second one is approving um, the contract itself, um, and that's pending review by the attorney. The budget for this is ten thousand um, dollars. That's approximately. It's a. It's not quite half, but it's almost half of what we had last year. Um, last year we had. Um, Friday concerts, we had um, weekly concerts, and they were all nationally touring acts, um, which was great. That was very, it, it um, did bring a, um, probably a two or three times more people into town, which I thought was really good. But um, one of the <coughs> things that happens when you're trying to do a big project is you have to cut costs. So um, this is something that um, is near and dear to the community and something that the DDA has done for years and years, but we can scale back and, and we asked 20 Front Street to scale back and they agreed and this is what we came up with. Motion to adopt the two resolutions attached to the agenda to Separate. hire 20 Front Street to we manage. We have to do them separately. Oh, we do? Mm-hmm. Okay. Do we have to read the whole resolution? No, you could just say the resolution number. Okay. Motion to adopt resolution DDA 23-001 attached to the agenda to hire 20 Front Street to manage the 2023 LO Live concert series. You need a second. Support. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Next one. Okay. Motion to adopt <clears throat> resolution DDA 23-002 attached to the agenda to hire 20 Front Street to manage the 2023 LO Live concert series. Support. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And the last of the new business and old business would be the parking study update, page 273 in your packet. All right. Um, the parking study update is attached in the packet. Also, the slideshow that we were able to see in January, both of those were included um, this time. Um, I provided on page 272, excuse me, 273 and 274, I did provide um, a summary of what was in the report. Um, 
One thing I wanted to point out though, is that um, they have recommended a parking sinking fund for improvements and maintenance of the parking. Um, that's, a, that's a, and this time they gave us an actual number. They did recommend that last time. Um, they put a number to it this time. It was $21,000 um, annually for this fund. Um, I know at Village Council they were talking about, you know, maybe it's time for paid parking. Um, this report doesn't act exactly, it does not say it's time for paid parking. It, it said it's time for more parking and it's also time for um, parking enforcement, which is what it said last time. Um, but I would recommend that we um, share this with um, the village staff and with um, the police department just to talk about what their recommendations are and where we want to go. Um, and then also I wanted to state that um, the, when we do parking, um, any money that's made for the parking, you know, it, it's made to, the parking revenue is supposed to go back into taking care of the parking. So um, it's meant to help pay for the um, enforcement officers, it's meant to pay for the equipment, it's meant to pay for maintaining the parking lots so that they're in good shape. Um, it's not a revenue stream that is separate from itself. It's a self-perpetuating machine is what it's supposed to be. <laughs> so, um, but, but again, the, the recommendation did not say it's time to move to paid parking here yet, so. Good. All right, and um, the motion that I recommend is on page 275. Motion to direct the executive director to share the report findings with village staff and LOPD and to receive and file. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. So now reports and resolution recommendations. So I guess the executive director report. Um, I want to say hi to Debbie Burgess, who may or may not be watching today. Um, we miss her. <laughs> I miss you, Debbie. Um, and I am very delighted to tell you that tentatively we get to welcome her back in March. Um, she says that the doctor is letting her, um, giving her back her freedom on March 1st. So um, fingers crossed we get to see her um, at the March uh, regular meeting. I also want to um, congratulate uh, the DDA um, for their accreditation. You should have received um, our report um, in, the, in your email today. Um, this is the fastest they've ever given us feedback. <laughs> I'm, and I like the report, it's very nice. It um, kind of gives us a, a roadmap that we can use um, when we're cons doing our daily work. So, um, take a look at that, and that'll be in our regular packet next month. And um, finally, um, I wanted to congratulate Matthew Shell, our DDA board member. He is has been um, selected as an elite 40 under 40 for Oakland County. Thank you. And then just to reiterate, um, if you want to look at um, page 73 will tell you um, about our funds. It's a legal memo and it'll talk about the funding for our project. Page 29 is that um, placemaking graphic, infographic that um, John Bry provided. And then page 28 has a um, version of the site design and it shows where the public gardens are, where the water features are. Um, it's just a uh, real quick um, look at that. And um, an update regarding our electrical vehicle charging stations. Um, we were able to test on two Fridays ago, we were testing it, or both of them. One of them is fully operational and it's working. Um, we got the software connected, so it's now on the map. Um, and the second one um, does not have the Wi-Fi SIM card, and that needs to be um, changed. And it sounds to me like um, out of all of the identical, they look identical, 
but we were supposed to get one set and another community was supposed to get the other set and it got flipped. So they're going to be fixing that pretty soon. But um, ours all have SIM cards in them so that they can operate without um, extra Wi-Fi. Are they so we have. Hmm? They're functioning already? I have one, one set, the, the one that is the furthest south, um, that, that set works, and then the one that is closest to the electrical panel, that one is inoperable right now. And is it marked? Yes, there's yeah. a sign on it. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and that is all, thank you. Have they given a timeline? Have they given a timeline for when it'll be operable? N no, they haven't given it. Next would be the uh, village manager report. <coughs> Darwin. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, just a few things real quick. Uh, first of all, uh, all of you should have noticed that at 35 North Broadway, uh, they have filled in that property. The debris is all gone. The, the site has been filled in. There is still, I would anticipate, some additional site restoration that will be necessary uh, as uh, the weather gets better. Uh, but uh, that uh, property is looking a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, at last week's council meeting, uh, the council approved um, Greens Park access management agreements uh, with Pedal Boat Pub and Tour on Orion uh, so that they can use uh, one of the village's boat docks uh, for their operations during the summer. So that will uh, help to um, connect uh, people who are on the lake with the downtown uh, business district, so that's exciting. Um, and uh, we just received notification that um, West Village 55 LLC uh, has been approved for their uh, commercial rehabilitation uh, tax exemption certificate, uh, and that certificate has been issued, so uh, they will they've been granted their 10-year tax abatement for the project. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> so next would be call to the public. As previous, please limit your comments to three minutes, address your comments to the vice chair, and be advised the board will not respond to your comments, but we'll use your comments in our discussions. Any, anybody from the public wishing to speak, please come forward. Johnson, so Julia Corian, try to do this in three minutes because I had no idea this was the program. It's not part of the agenda. I'll go through this real quick. Page 52 of your information and your financial reports, it appears that you have gone over the budgeting for capital outlays. That's a violation of Michigan law. The budget has to be amended before the expenditure is incurred. You obviously don't care. I couldn't comment on it before you did that. The property acquisition lake lumber Orion lumber, lumber yard, uh, as I mentioned, I have over 40 years of experience in construction. I could answer Mrs. Campbell's questions about the soils and pollutants, but no opportunity to do that, so I won't waste your time because you obviously don't want to know. You have no budget for the improvements. I have filed 12 FOIAs so far trying to find out what isn't in public information and discussed at meetings. You have no idea, other than the purchase price, what it's going to cost you to do anything with this property. It's a wonderful concept to do it. You have nothing to go ahead and do it with and justify the cost. Let's talk about the cost. We keep talking about a $5 million bond. As in the reports and was mentioned by your executive director, it's going to cost the taxpayers, unless you find some other funding, over almost $6.9 million, but you don't know if it's going to cost more. That's what it's going to cost. And it's not TIF revenue that falls from the sky. It is taxpayer funds. I live in the DDA TIF revenue district. If I understand the law correctly and how it's worked, every single dollar of my property taxes go to the DDA, a non-elected board, not elected by the people, that you can do that with that money as you wish. And I can't say anything about it unless I can pocket into three minutes before or after you're done making your decisions. This is just wrong. It's absolutely wrong. I don't think I'll come back to these meetings again. That's a waste of my time. I'll go talk to the council. At least they're elected. They have some responsibility to respond. You apparently don't, and you like it that way. And I can understand that. It makes it easier. Final issue, dumpster enclosures. 
I've designed these, I've detailed them, I've reviewed construction documents, I reviewed the construction, I re reviewed the bills. Done that for years. I probably have hundreds of samples. What was in your package doesn't say what it's to be built out of. One drawing says brick, one shows split face block. You say to follow 120 North Broadway, which is the Bitter Tom's apartment building, except there's no picture of that. So the contractor has no idea what you want. Is it one of the two pictures or a picture that they don't have to see, they have to go out and drive and find out. There's no dimension on the plan. They don't know what they're building. They know they're building it somewhere in the corner of the parking lot, but they don't know exactly where. As far as I can tell, because the specifications are completely inadequate, that doesn't meet the, planning the zoning ordinance requirements and planning commission approval for a dumpster enclosure, which requires planning commission approval and has zoning ordinance requirements. None of that's in there, and it doesn't meet them because there's nothing in there. You are going to get bids all over the place, and three people who may have no experience in construction are going to be asked to review those based on information that doesn't exist. I have no idea what you're going to get, no idea what it's going to cost you. You can take the low bid if that's what you like, but you're just putting contractors through a nuisance bid because they don't know what they're doing. You get a much better price and fairer bids when you put out complete specifications and drawings for what you want. Don't make the contractor come back to you and then you guess afterwards. Thank you. I'm Thank done. you for your time. Any other? Please. My name is Jim Childers. I live at 197 West Flint Street. Uh, for a number of years, I always heard the term DDA, kind of knew what it was about, um, was aware of some of the events that went on as under you guys' guidance. And I thought, okay, that's kind of cool, but I really didn't know a whole lot about you guys. Um, after the Mosseri development started coming in, I became much more connected with my local government, and that ebbed and flowed through the years depending on the topics and whatever. As a result of that, I became much more aware of DDA and realized what a job you guys do, what an outstanding job you guys do. And it is deeply appreciated. This uh, lumberyard property has raised some questions. Now this is purely anecdotal, but I've talked to probably about six or seven people who were like, why, is, why are they buying that? What's going on with that? I said, well, because it's gonna benefit the community. And if they don't go in and do this, you're gonna have more apartments or condos in there. Is that something you want with all this going on with the Mosseri development? Well, no, I don't want that. Then maybe you should be aware of what the DDA is doing to benefit this community. And I applaud all of you for that. You do an outstanding job. Appreciate you. Thank you for your comments. Any other public comment, please? I just have a quick question. Um, Rosemary Ford, 225 North Broadway. With these EV chargers, I'm just curious, so how is it, how does it work? How will they be charged? I'm assuming it's through credit card, but is there a standard rate? Or how is it we, it's worked? How does it work? If you have the time, or you can get with me another time, I don't know, but I'm just curious, because I've had some people ask me, and I thought the same thing. I thought, well, I really don't know. Um, public comments, we don't respond to, but I can talk That's to you fine. afterwards. That'd be fine. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Any others? So I guess we'll end public comment. Next would be board comments and uh, training feedback. I want to start with. I think that just something that, that stuck out to me after after hearing everything, um, especially with Mos Rosemary mentioned earlier, the, the lyrics of the song that you pay paradise and put up a parking lot. What's there right now is not paradise. Mm -hmm. There is pollution. <laughs> there are things that I would never, I have three-year-old twins who like to put everything in their mouth and I was just thinking if that was a park or if there are certain parts, I would never want to bring my children there. So after reading the phase two report, I definitely am excited about what's putting there, but there are a lot of things that I don't even know and there's certain areas that I know that have to be kept and there has to be the concrete in the parking lot just so that you know our kids can be safe. Well, when I look at these uh, whole um, lumber yard, we're cleaning up something that if we don't do something now, it may sit there for another 30 years. Now, 
we don't have the exact plans yet. We're looking for input still on that. We're going to have to take the puzzles of where the contamination is and what you can build and put them together before we go to the next step. But you know what? It's exciting that we're going there. Uh, just thank you to Molly and your team and congratulations again on the Main Street accreditation. And that's all I've got. Um, congrats again to Matt. Very exciting being thank selected you. as a 40 under 40. That's a really big honor. Well, thank you. So you'll have to let us know when the I will. shindig yeah. is at the county so we can come support you. Sounds good. Um, and then I also noticed that the railing went up by Wine Social. Looks very nice and uh, provides additional pedestrian safety for our community. So excited about that. I'm going to. I'm good. Sure. Passing. Yeah. Jerry? Um, just a couple of comments. And I, I'm just as a council member, I'm really appreciative of uh, the process by which we developed through the committee the 75 25 backed infrastructure. Every year, as the council debates budgets and they look at that, we, we look at what are the infrastructure needs in the community. So certainly we have our DDA capture district and the purpose of that is to enhance the DDA capture district and the business opportunities. And again, certainly improving the roads or sidewalks or water infrastructure in those areas is vital to that infrastructure enhancement. So now we have a funding revenue stream that wasn't there before for the purpose of infrastructure. And that was the word that's been bounced around by councils as they look at doing budgets. So I'm, I'm just really appreciative of that uh, cooperative development that we came up with that because I think that it, at least it does for me as an individual member um, know that the DDA is looking at that need as a, as a huge need within our community uh, to fund that. And parking is infrastructure. <laughs> and parking certainly is going to enhance our downtown district and I, I truly as someone who has policed this town since I had a mustache and hair, <laughs> um, it, it's something that we have to do uh, because it is the best problem and the worst problem that we have. It's the good news and bad news of our downtown and our success. So uh, we can do that. And, and the final thought is that just please remember with this phase two uh, information that's out there and it is public, um, our, this project is not going to create uh, surface lever pollutants. In other words, no one using this project is at risk at any time in any way of anything that's on this site. Uh, it's why this development, I think, um, is perhaps one of the only proposals um, that could work in an environmentally safe and friendly way. The more you disturb that with deep development, um, uh, certainly then that would create an economic uh, uh, problem both for the developer and the risk of exposing our community to those uh, toxins. So, uh, again, it's my understanding we have been told, and I understand that with uh, the phase two report being what it is, the development that's being proposed will not create uh, any hazard. In fact, it'll mitigate any pollutant hazard to this community. So that's that's a bonus. Excellent. And that's all I have. Thank you. So I'm really proud of this volunteer DDA board. All of us volunteers here volunteer our time. And I was, I was, I signed up for one meeting a month. I've probably been to 12 this past two, these two months. Just, you know, it's a volunteer thing. And any time someone wants to volunteer and help out, if they have expertise to reveal, maybe they can volunteer to be part, of a, board, to be part of, a, of a committee. I mean, I'm a chiropractor. I'm not an expert on, on landfills. I'm not an expert on, on, on building developments. But I know with our, with our volunteers, we can get there and, and do the best we can with what we have. But this volunteer organization called the DDA that does so many great things for our community is pretty amazing. And I'm proud to be part of this DDA board, and I'm very proud of the, of the, the men and women that are here to help us represent our, our downtown Lake Orion district. And I think this Lake Orion Lumberyard project, we talked about this six months ago. One of the main, pro one of the main we looked at what, what are the main um, objectives of this property. One was we knew that it was a head, we knew that phase two was gonna show something. And guess what, phase two shows something. We know that it's a hazard, a potential hazard in our community. And we know that 
by doing the right thing for our future, for our children, is what we're all about. I'm not sure someone else going in, in this project would do the right thing for the, pro for, the, for the property. I know that by us having control of the property or having guidance of the property, it, it'll be a better resource for our, for our downtown community. So I'm proud to say that this Lakeland project is a great idea. And yes, there's things to be proved upon. And our whole goal is to make our community part of this, these efforts. That's what I have these meetings for, so we can talk. This isn't a done deal. This is the beginning of a project that's going to be continuing to go on for many, many years. So I'm very proud to be part of this board. I'm grateful for everybody that's here. And that's my comment. Uh, next would be... The next regular meeting would be March 21st of 2023. And motion to adjourn. Second. Any, any, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I didn't think so. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Did you say March 21st?